now we'll be hearing a presentation from Ms. Khadija Dahimi. It's about navigating transnationality, transcending Eurocentrics in Leila Abu, uh, yes, Leila Abu Leila, the translator. So uh, my presentation today is about uh, Leila Abu Leila's uh, uh, novel, The Translator. It is titled Navigating Transnationality, Transcending Eurocentrism in Leila Abu Leila's novel, The Translator. And I'm going to talk about three main uh, elements. The first one, the imperialist discourse in the translator. The second one, uh, transcending Eurocentrism in the linguistic arena. And the third one, the intercultural dialogue in the translator. So we start with, the, uh, with this quote by uh, Edward Said. He says, the relation between Orientalist and Orient was essentially hermeneutical. So here we are talking about the interpretation and representation of the other. And here lies the main problem of misunderstanding and, and misrepresentation of the other. So it's in this light uh, that we are going to discuss uh, Abu Leila's translator. Let's start with the first element, the imperialist discourse in the translator. So a part of the confrontational debate between the West and the East is the imperialist discourse that the main characters of the novel engage in. We have Ray, the, uh, the Orientalist academic, Samar, the Sudanese Muslim immigrant, and her friend Yasmin. So Ray, as depicted in the novel, is a typical Orientalist in spite of the fact that, that he tries not to be one. Even intellectuals say their culture through the supremacist stance. Besides, Ray confides. He says, What I regret the most is I used to write things like uh, Islam gives dignity to those who otherwise do not have dignity in their lives. Therefore, the modern Orientalists see Muslims as people with no inherent dignity, people who resort to religion as a psychological source to try to compensate for their inherent inferiority as human beings. Accordingly, the Western academic milieu is still unprepared to observe the West and the rest in parallel. On this account, Abu Leila would like to draw the, uh, the reader's attention to the fact that even those who show their empathy for the other still perfectly fit in with Orientalism. We move to transcending Eurocentrism in the linguistic arena. The cultural dialogue uh, suffers different, in, uh, different hindrances of which we find the impossibility to translate all aspects of a given culture. Language often fails to transmit cultural meanings and values so accurately. In this respect, Abu Leila plays on the linguistic chord to show the distinctive nature of each culture with no preference of one to the other. As such, the novelist challenges non-Arab readers with inserting some Arabic words with no intention to offer their synonyms in English. Apart from transcending Eurocentrism and inverting its supremacist discourse, time in English, so to speak, operates as a channel through which Abu Leila acclaims the uniqueness of her culture of origin. Of the, uh, this quotation by uh, Abdul Kabir Khatib, he says, Irony might not only have been a kind of displaced re uh, revenge on the part of the oppressed colonized seduced by the West, but would have also allowed the Anglophone North African writer to take his own distance on the language by inverting it, destroying it, and pressing new structures to the point where the English reader would feel a stranger in his own language. So here we are talking about subverting the English language in the, uh, in the novel. Uh, therefore, the novelist teases her readers to incite their inquisitiveness and to get them involved in her culture. We have expressions like this. Um, Ya Allah, Ya Arham al Rahimin, Insha'Allah, and Wudu. Uh, so, engaging the reader in the translation process serves the novel's general process through the involvement of the other into the cultural dialogue. The function of using such tra and translatable aspects of culture in the translator is to reveal the limitations of the Orientalist characterization of Islam and Muslims. Through the employment of the main characters, Samar, Ray, and to some extent, Yasmin, the novel slowly yet steadily delves in the discourse of the West versus the East. As both of Samar and Ray grow interested in one another, the progress of the conversations elaborates to be more of a dialogue between civilizations. In this process, Samar tries to keep cultural markers intact so as to maintain their cultural authenticity and to show that some aspects of her Arabic identity are untranslatable, thus uncompromised. Samar's profession as a translator grants her a place which allows her to remain connected to the two cultures concurrently. By the end of the novel, Ray transcends his Eurocentric views and goes on to pursue his, spirit his spiritual and emotional aspirations. He undergoes a tiring journey to Sudan in order to marry Samar. In her turn, Samar re relinquishes her desire to stay in her homeland and eventually decides to go with her husband. In fact, the harmonious relationship between Samar and Ray reverberates the, uh, the novelist's endeavor to create an imaginary space 
where the two cultures reconcile two episodes of mis misunderstanding. As a conclusion, I would like to say that by shedding light on the cultural divergences, Abu Leila aims to arrive at sites of cultural convergences. The, novel the novelist challenges this stagnant state to quo of the discourse of the East versus the West. Her novel engages in a didactical depiction of the erroneous prejudices and the hegemonic imperial discourse. Therefore, the readers are invited to take part in the novel's conversations. Equally important, by juxtaposing the two cultures, Abu Leila accentuates the particularities of each culture without risking to demean or demonize any, uh, uh, anyone at the expense of the other. Additionally, by transcending the concept which says that the East is merely the antithesis of the West, Abu Leila comes to visualize, picture, and bring both of them uh, together in parallel. Finally, I would like to end my presentation with this uh, verse and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. Thank you so much. Huda uh, al Yes. With the restoration of most African voices in Ashibis, things fall apart. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my topic is entitled the, Res the Restoration of Lost African Voices in Achibis Things Fall Apart. So uh, when we speak of things fall apart, actually we cannot uh, dissociate it from Heart of Darkness. So uh, uh, a bloody racist, that is how Chinua Achibi described British uh, writer Joseph Conrad as a reaction to Heart of Darkness. The mm -hmm. reaction of Achibi created uh, a, a polemy over whether Conrad's novella is racist or not to invade the Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism of European writers and their scandalous discourse on African subjects, Achibi wrote things fall apart. Since then, this latter novella is considered as the mother of African literature because of the rich bag of proverbs, folk tales, songs, tribal rituals, African dialects, and religious superstitions. Achibi's critical engagement made an analogy to the African tribal oral tradition and the novel European literature tradition focusing on the effect of this letter on the mind of the colonized. So the image of Africa that was narrated in Achibi's novella is to be celebrated, not abjured. Despite his criticism to some traditions in the village of Amofia, Achibi bequeathed a legacy where he challenged the stereotypes and restored the lost voices of African characters and nations who, according to Spivak, went through the process of silencing in European literature. He critically called for the quest of see other human beings as human beings, that debased racism that presented Africans as cannot represent themselves, thus they must be represented. As a writer whose family lived the words of colonization and decolonization, he was aware of the interior and exterior pressure of the colonial power that leaves behind an eroded, bloody, and mitigable legacy. This legacy was better represented through the psyche of the main character, Okonko, and his remarkable voice in the novella. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, my uh, communication is entitled, yeah, my uh, communication is entitled, Good News Vernacular Revolutions, Pregnant Cultural Deracination, and Expressing the Particularity of African self -care. So it will not far, uh, fall far uh, from what has already been said about politics of language in the African literature. So throughout uh, these few minutes, I will try to sketch out the evolution of uh, Gugi's historical and revolutionary project uh, regarding decolonizing the African mind. As you see in this uh, picture, after uh, the third wave of decolonization, the African continent had found itself already baptized into the different uh, European languages. This, of course, had created one of the most profound dialectics of post-colonial discourse. This has to do uh, with whether to opt for European languages or African languages as modes of uh, literary expression. So here we have uh, two views, the first one by Chinua Achibi, uh, Salman Roshdi, Katib Yassin. Uh, all these considered writing uh, in European languages is a point of strength because it allows to get uh, engaged in a complex process of writing back to the colonizer in the language of the colonizer, of the colonizer and in so doing, language can be seen as a weapon. But on the other hand, uh, Gugi's appearance to the African uh, intellectual scene was a revolutionary event par excellence. So Gugi uh, invited uh, African uh, writers to write African literatures only in African languages. Gugi, as a matter of fact, catapulted 
uh, catapults criticism against the linguistic dependence of uh, Africa on European languages. Uh, he considers uh, writing uh, African literature in European languages as a systematically cultural deracination and a blatant self-distinciation of the African individual from the African reality and the African uh, uh, roots. So, uh, more than this, uh, Gugi considers language as a mode of spiritual subjugation by the colonizer. Once again, I just quote from his uh, Decolonizing the Mind. He says, the bullet was the means of the physical subjugation. Language was the means of spiritual subjugation. Language and literature were taking us further and further from ourselves to ourselves, from our world to other worlds. This is the cultural deracination of the African individual from uh, an African uh, matrix, so to speak, to another world that is alien to them. Uh, in fact, uh, the idea of decolonizing the mind uh, uh, was theorized by, uh, uh, by the exponents of post-colonial theory, such as Franz Fanon, who argues in his seminal book, uh, Black Skin and White Mask, I quote, to speak means to be in a position to use a certain syntax, to grasp the morphology of this or that language. That it means, above all, to assume a culture to support the weight of a civilization. Mm -hmm. So, faced with the consequence of uh, the fact that uh, English is uh, saturated by metaphors and meanings related to uh, 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 imperialism, uh, Gugi had achieved a far-reaching, uh, let's say, conversion from English language to the Gokoyo language. Uh, one of the most important, uh, let's say, uh, uh, tangible achievements of this conversion was uh, his writing of a uh, play in Gikoyo language entitled, I'm not, by the way, fluent in Gikoyo language, uh, Gahida and Dinda, okay, which means I will marry when I want. So uh, this uh, play uh, effectively has translated uh, the, the walk into, the, sorry, the talk into the walk, uh, it represented the African particularity. Ngugi has uh, argued that Africa does not exist and does not live in European languages. Uh, the particularity of African selfhood can be achieved only, according to Ngugi, through Africa's vernacular languages uh, and cultures that have been for a long time nurturing and they are still the author's imagination giving them an African selfhood, uh, an African sense of originality. So, in, in, in the second part of this communication, I'd like to respond critically to this question. In what way does Gugi's novel uh, or masterpiece, Metigari, decolonize? So, uh, Gugi is uh, Metigari uh, is a picaresque novel that was written in Gikoyo language. It is one of his best achievements. So, the novel decolonizes at two levels. The first one, uh, it decolonizes with its linguistic power of libertarian discourse. Uh, the second one, for the weighty charge of the Gikoyo culture it embraces. So uh, there is here a, 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 a Kenyan uh, critic uh, called Washanga who hates Ngugi's artistic genius in Gikoyo language. Uh, he uh, considers this uh, language as offering a unique mood. I quote, in Metigari, the oral narrative fuels Ngugi's certain fluency in Gikoyo, a mood which he rarely captures when he writes in English. So, uh, when uh, deconstructing the title, Metigari Manjirongi, uh, in Gikoyo it means the patriot who survived the bullet. So here we may see some, uh, uh, let's say, Mau Mau patriots who led a revolutionary war against the British colonizer. Okay, so uh, Metigari seems to, to be saying that uh, its main aim is to, reignite, to reignite Mau Mauism. Uh, Gugi, in an interview, he, he says about Metigari, what I really meant in the novel is that the spirit of Mao Mao is still much alive in Kenyan society. 
So, uh, uh, yes, okay. Secondly, the novel decolonizes in its attempt to remove the infiltration of Western culture into the fabric of the uh, 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 Gikoyoko society. So here, um, uh, Matigari is meant for fighting the cultural ravages of, of, of uh, colonialism. So here, the following picture shows what can be called the Mogomo tree. The Mogomo tree is one of the prevalent motifs, okay, motifs in the novel. So the Mogomo tree uh, is a sacred tree of cultural, religious, and political power, okay, in the Gukoyo culture. So the, the tree symbolizes a return to the roots and a return to the rhythmic Gikoyo culture. So as a conclusion, uh, I'd like to say that uh, decolonizing the mind is not uh, a new project in itself. For example, the Sheikh Bashir Ibrahimi had said in the Basayr journal, I, I found the expression or the statement in Arabic, and I translated it into English. He says, decolonizing the mind, this was during the uh, 40s, when Algeria was colonized. Decolonizing the mind is certainly the basis and the origin of body decolonization. It is not possible to emancipate a body whose mind mm -hmm. is still enslaved. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, as a conclusion, I can say that each revolution has got its mastermind, and the mastermind of Africa's vernacular revolution was Ngugi. Who says it all? Um, he says, language is, uh, as culture is mediating between me and myself, between myself and other selves, between me and nature, language is mediating in my very being. Thank you so much for listening, and see you on other occasions, inshallah. Thank you, Mohammed, for addressing this interesting topic. Um, Thank you. Now we'll be listening to Dr. Saleh Faid with a presentation about post-colonial African literature and manifestations of violence in en attendant le vote des bêtes sauvages of Ahmadou Kourouma. Yes. Merci. Alors, salam alaikum. Euh, je tiens tout d'abord, avant de commencer, de remercier les organisateurs de cette manifestation, en leur tête, euh, ma collègue Horia Mehoubi, d'avoir pensé à cette problématique. Ensuite, je tiens à m'excuser auprès euh, des participants d'avoir de, communiqué en langue française. Mon niveau en anglais étant très médium, donc euh, je vous prie de m'excuser. Alors, l'intitulé de ma communication « Littérature africaine postcoloniale » des manifestations de la violence dans le roman en attendant euh, le vote des bêtes sauvages d'Amadou Kouroma. Donc, en ce qui concerne le plan, je vais essayer tout d'abord de parler de la notion de violence dans le roman. Ensuite, je vais essayer d'expliciter un peu la problématique de ma communication et l'approche que j'ai appliquée. Et euh, dans, un de, dans un deuxième temps, je parlerai de quelques traits de la violence dans le roman pour euh, enfin conclure en essayant de donner une typologie de cette violence qui a permis à l'auteur de donner une signification à son roman. Alors, pour commencer, la violence est un concept qui constitue une thématique récurrente dans la littérature postcoloniale africaine. Ce concept a fait l'objet d'importantes études. Il continue de le faire dans plusieurs œuvres contemporaines. Bernard Molaris souligne que, je cite, « la violence est un thème majeur de la fiction africaine ». Son importance tient à la place qu'elle occupe dans l'expérience historique des peuples africains à travers la traite, l'esclavage, le colonialisme, la décolonisation, l'apartheid, les guerres particulièrement atroces. Fin de citation. Cela signifie que cette notion dénote des écarts de toutes sortes, tant sur le plan linguistique que sur la forme même des écrits, glissement de sens, élaboration insolite, création de mots, déroute, déformation lexicale et sémantique, etc., représente des manifestations d'une écriture fondée sur l'expérience de la violence. Mon intervention a tant à projeter la lumière sur les principales caractéristiques de la violence dans l'œuvre d'Amadou Kouroma, en attendant le vote des bêtes sauvages. La particularité de cette œuvre fondée sur la violence est qu'elle a une dimension référentielle, c'est-à-dire un rapport au réel, et entretient un rapport avec l'histoire Événementielle, elle constitue pour la plupart le témoignage de faits réels vécus. Dans le roman En attendant le vote des bêtes sauvages de Kouroma, 
sont mises à nu l'obsession du pouvoir, la démence des nouveaux maîtres après les indépendances. Dès lors, l'on se pose la question suivante. Les facteurs qui sont à la base de l'éclosion de la violence, la perception de l'autre, la représentation qu'on fait de sa personne et la construction des stéréotypes sont des vecteurs de ce phénomène. C'est l'image de l'autre constitue sur des clichés et donnant de lui une image négative et provoque son rejet et peut à la longue fait naître des conflits. Le roman « En attendant les votes des bêtes sauvages » d'Amadou Koroma décrit une typologie de violence. On peut citer trois types de violence. Premièrement, la violence structurelle, qui est le fait des structures économiques et politiques et qui place les citoyens dans des conditions de vie insupportables. Deuxièmement, la violence physique, qui englobe toutes les formes d'atteinte physique perpétrées contre les individus. Et troisièmement, la violence ordinaire, qui est diffuse dans les attitudes et les comportements des individus et qui est, à la langue, vécue comme une situation normale. La société tout entière devient comprise par une psychose générale et celle-ci devient alors incapable de juger et de raisonner. Je vous remercie de votre écoute. On vous remercie pour votre présentation. Uh, last but not least, we move back to Dr. Mihubi with her yes. presentation about Eurocentrism and Afrocentrism, a tat for a tat bar. Yeah, thank, you, thank you, uh, Dr. Nassima Meroche. Um, you know, because of time limitation, I won't uh, spend much time in my presentation. My paper is entitled Uh, Eurocentrism and Afrocentrism, a tit for tat uh, battle. In fact, you know that Eurocentrism uh, is uh, just like Orientalism. Uh, it is uh, an ideology or any inclination towards making Europe as the center and non European cultural civilization uh, in the periphery. Uh, and uh, When you read uh, Eurocentric uh, uh, literature or, uh, or European history in general, you uh, find that uh, Europeans in general um, find it hard to get rid of their Eurocentrism. For example, uh, Conrad, just Conrad, though he was uh, anti-imperialist and he uh, uh, wrote against imperialism, but Uh, we can easily realize that in his heart of darkness, he couldn't get rid of his Eurocentrism. Not only the Jews of Conrad, even in, uh, in America, when you read, for example, American literature, you find that Roger Williams, when he uh, uh, backed uh, the Indians, when he uh, uh, fought um, with the Indians against uh, the authorities in uh, Massachusetts Bay colonies, uh, colony, He couldn't uh, get rid of his Eurocentrism because he continued uh, criticizing uh, the Indian life. Uh, and uh, uh, he uh, um, had this inferiority complex. Okay, uh, to fight uh, Eurocentrism, the African writers uh, tried to uh, invent or to uh, bring something new, which is Afrocentrism. So if Eurocentrism is put in, Europe in the center and Africa in the periphery. Afrocentrism is putting Africa in the center and putting Europe in the center. That's why it is a tit for tat battle. It, it is just like Orientalism and Occidentalism. Orientalism is the negative portrayal of the Orient. And uh, Occidentalism is often defined as the negative Um, portrayal of Europe, because in, uh, in, in, in your uh, Orientalist uh, writings uh, in Asia or in the Middle East or even in Africa, uh, Europe is always portrayed as a symbol of colonialism, symbol of oppression, symbol of uh, uh, narcissism, symbol of negation. So if the European writers tried to write and to put Africa as a place of negation, as the antithesis of uh, civilizations, African writers, Achibi, Ngugi, uh, for example, I can cite also uh, uh, the Sudanese uh, writer Tayyip Saleh, uh, who uh, wrote his famous uh, novel, uh, The Season of Migration to the North. If we take uh, uh, the season of migration to, uh, to the North, 
and we compare it to uh, uh, Conrad's uh, uh, Things Fall Apart, we find that there is a, uh, a type or a kind of uh, dialogism between uh, Joseph Conrad and um, uh, Tayyip Saleh. For Tayyip Saleh, uh, Europe is the heart of whiteness. Just uh, uh, like uh, Conrad when he portrayed Africa as uh, the heart of uh, uh, darkness. So because of time limitation, I won't uh, spend much time. Uh, the floor is yours, Nasima. Thank you. Questions? If you don't have any questions, so uh, we move to you, Dr. Mihubi. I mean, if you have any yes. uh, conclusion or recommendations. Ah, I think that we should end, okay? Yes. Uh, but before that, I'd like to uh, to cite the uh, recommendations, okay? Other than here. First of all, I'd like to thank the participants from the different universities, from uh, Biskra, from uh, Algiers too, from Betna, from Wergla, from uh, Constantine, and uh, from uh, Busada, I think. Uh, Ecole Supérieure de Busada, uh, and without forgetting uh, to thank uh, my colleagues who uh, helped me, in fact, uh, uh, in um, uh, achieving this uh, scientific event. Uh, I apologize for uh, those who uh, couldn't join us on this live stream. And I wish that we can meet again. As far as the recommendations of this scientific event, we have many, and I have tried to summarize them in the 11 points. The first, the language of the colonizer should be seriously upheld as a weapon in divulging the subtleties of the oppressed Africans, a down-to-earth language rather than a mere artistry. The appropriation of language could be the mouthpiece of the colonized, robed in traditional modesty, uh, modest expression, or modesty of expression that mirrors the local African culture. Uh, cultural identity is to be valorized beyond the mere use of language, which is just a skeptic cover. Women's struggle in African writings are just an appeal to nature rather than a fake resistance. So it is the order of the day against the stereotypes. Uh, transcending Eurocentrism is a recall of self identity, traditional culture, and originality for the African writers. The restoration of the African voices cannot be achieved in peevish moments, but should endure ages to stand on its feet a long enduring struggle with pen. Post-colonial literature is all aspiring for the old mature writers as they depict naturalism in its absolute truth. Vernacular revolution, cultural deracination need a harsh language appropriation, a language lucid and understood by the Africans, yet charged with meanings for the colonizers to consider and take heart. The topic of uh, the uh, study day is broad. Okay? One of the recommendations is that the topic of uh, the study day is broad. And we see that study day is not enough. Hence, we recommend for enlarging it into an international conference with participation, with the participation of African scholars. Why not? Uh, we propose the publication of the papers in a special issue, if we can. And finally, we suggest uh, more focus on the Algerian literature because the other non-Algerian is always keen to know what the Algerian literature has to say about the Algerian uh, experience. Again, I'd like to thank all the participants, those from the University of Ancilla, and those who uh, from the other universities. And I hope that we uh, can meet in other scientific events. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>